Are you hoping to look as dashing as a girl in general? Or perhaps looking into expanding your relic collection? Or perhaps hoping to adopt a puppy into your mount family? If so, you might be aware that you need to free Bosia from Garleon War Terrors. If this seems like a daunting task, don't worry. This guide is going to help you understand how to best make use of the tools Bosia offers to get the maximum rank effortlessly before farming its loot to your desires. If you've seen my Eureka guide before, you sort of know what to expect. An in-depth view of all things Bosia, focused on saving you time and optimizing your way to maximum rank. Note, however, that Bosia is a lot more streamlined in comparison with Eureka and the game puts you on a rather clear trajectory of how you're able to progress through it. Therefore, this guide will be focused around bringing all this information together along with giving some advice on what to equip or focus on for specific questing ranges. In order to achieve this and to guide Gather the necessary footage, I have leveled my three alt characters for Bosia. First on NA, then on AU, and the third one on Cloud Data Center that Square Enix has given us for free for one week. My main has done Bosia back in Shadowbringer, so this proved to be a good comparison lesson for me as well, and the Cloud DC job skips made it easy for me to try a variety of jobs I didn't get to progress on before. Additionally, because I am not as much of a nerd for Bosia as I am for Eureka, I have requested help from one, Vega Novus, an admin of Savage Slime's Discord server, specializing in Delubrum Regine runs on Light Data Center. Thank you Vega for all the help, and if you are on EU, make sure to check out his server when you are ready for Delubrum Regine Savage at the end of Bosia. Before we dive in, here's an overview of the guide's chapters so you know exactly what to expect. Also, feel free to use the timestamps and jump around as you need while you progress the content. Chapter 0 exists because of all the unlock requirements that Bosia has. If you haven't touched this content yet and not sure how to go about unlocking it, check this chapter. Chapter 1 covers all the Bosia basics, the dictionary of terms that the rest of the guide will rely on. It explains metal, resistance rank, skirmishes, critical engagements, lost actions, and a variety of other useful tips that form Bosia into what it is. This chapter is a must to check out and to refer back to whenever you forget some of the core mechanics of this content. Chapters 2, 3, and 4 cover specific instances, Bosian Southern Front, the Lubrum Regine Normal, and Zadnor. Each of these chapters contains sections about what to focus on for specific rank ranges, guides for lost actions to use during leveling, tips about specific fights that might prove troublesome along the way, and tips about tackling the mandatory raid content within each respective instance, Castrum Lacositore and Dalriada. Because everyone's journey is different, you'll find very detailed timestamps in the first comment of the video to allow you to jump around whenever you're looking for some specific information. And lastly, chapter 5 covers some extras, things you don't overly worry about until the Bosia endgame. How to access the Lubrum Regine Savage, what are solo challenges or duels, and how to prepare for them, and how to farm field notes. And with that, let's get started. Bosia is Shadowbringer's endgame content and it has way too many unlock requirements. To summarize immediately, you need to have finished 5.1 patch, House of Virtue, Deeds of Cruelty, and the whole Evilis Alliance raid questline from Stormblood to unlock base Bosia instance, the Southern Front. However, for the second part of Bosia, Zadnor, you also need to finish patch 5.4, Futures Rewritten, MSQ content. I would advise getting 5.4 done as soon as possible, before or after unlocking Bosnian Southern Front, because Zadnor is a lot more beneficial to you for leveling and ranking purposes, so you don't want to be stuck unlocking it for too long. If you have all the requirements, the NPC to unlock Bosnia will be in Gugane with a quest called Hail to the Queen. Coincidentally, if you still need to do Evilist stuff, that's also unlocked in Kugane. Once you've fully done the Evilist questline, you'll get a New Game Plus chapter unlocked, and that's how you know when you're done. Once you're done with all the unlock requirements, you'll quickly be sent to Domain Enclave, where you'll immediately want to visit the main Aetherite and pin it to favorites, so it never gets lost in the list of past teleports later. If you haven't attuned to all the mini Aetherites in the area, take a minute and do it now, as this will soon unlock ability to teleport to Bosia area directly from Domain Enclave. Bosia area, Gangos, doesn't have its own Aetherite, so this will save you a lot of clicks and travel time. When you arrive to Gangos, you'll be met with a quest called the Bosia Incident, for which the game tells you to set aside sufficient amount of time. No worries, I won't spoil this duty, but I'm mentioning it because it's quite long, about 50 minutes with all the cutscenes, and quite interesting. Expect multiple boss fights, pretty areas to walk through, as well as unskippable conversations inside. 
After this quest, you'll pick up your first relic quest, the only relic quest that is a requirement for anything to do with Wajia. It's called Fire in the Forge, and you need at least a level 80 job that can make a Shadowbringer's relic weapon. Meaning, you cannot be a job that came out in Endwalker or later, like Reaper or Viper. Finally, the quest after that, where Eagle's Nest becomes available with Marshak at the tent, which unlocks the southern front. There is another blue quest available there, which leads you to Geralt's and Zlatan's stand, and this is relic related. I do recommend talking to them until you get for want a memory active. Job honestly doesn't matter for this stage, you just want to activate this to collect some relic materials as you progress through Bosia. You can enter Bosia on any job that's level 71 or higher, and you do not have to be on your relic making job. Bosnia as a whole content package consists out of two large field instances, Bosnian Southern Front and Zadnor, and one Alliance-style raid, the Lubrum Regine. The Lubrum also has the Savage version, but I'll only be talking about this at the very end of the guide, as it is fully optional content. Inside Bosnia, you're getting actual job experience and poetics as long as you're a job level 71 or above. When you enter Bosnia, your item level is synced to 430 and you are as strong as you're gonna get. There is no traditional leveling of power available until the very end game. This does mean that once you've achieved maximum rank, you can get a lot stronger and farming additional loot will be getting a lot easier. The power is coming mainly from special duty actions you'll be unlocking and using all throughout the duty, rather than your own level. Hence, the recommendation is to prioritize ranking up, then going backwards, finishing stuff you still want to do when you're stronger and with better actions. Note that Bosnia leveling is actually quite viable even up to level 90, especially for DPS jobs as you avoid long queue times for regular dungeons in Endwalker. Also, even though this is a solo focused guide, it is worth noting that Bosnia very much benefits from doing content while partied up. Even if you are spread apart on the map doing different things, you will all get various drops that other party members may be farming, everything is done more quickly, so experience and other grinds are more efficient. Don't be afraid to party up if an opportunity shows itself. To progress Vaz's story and its content, you are collecting metal, your battle courage so to speak, which increases your resistance rank. You can collect both experience and metal inside the instances by participating in two types of engagements, skirmishes and critical engagements. Now skirmishes are essentially like fates, they pop all the time and most of them do not need any special requirements to be active. I say most as some of them do require killing some mobs, but more on that when I explain the monster types. There are several types of skirmishes, marked with these different icons. It is worth noting down what type of a skirmish you're going to, do not waste time killing spawns of enemies if you can simply pull and target their boss and finish the skirmish that way. Also, it's useful reading the skirmish description to avoid killing enemies if the progress bar is filled by destroying crates, for example. If you're doing this content alone, try to avoid boss skirmishes and make sure to not over pull the monster spawn type fate in order to not get overwhelmed. It's worth noting that sometimes the skirmishes can be scaled rather poorly. They die too quickly or get too tanky, so it's better doing them in a party whenever possible. On the other hand, critical engagements need some criteria to pop, either a chain of skirmishes that need to be cleared or enough killed enemies of a specific type. They have much better scaling formula and more important mechanics to keep in mind, but not too many mechanics. Critical engagements also have a player limit, ranging from 24 to 48 players, though this barely matters after Shadowbringers. Though these engagements also have different icons, most of them boil down to killing a boss, so the type doesn't really matter. Whenever a CE pops, you'll get a notice on your screen, and you can apply to it through the special HUD menu you get in Bosnia. People usually party up once they join the CE area, even if they normally spend time alone, so I recommend not being shy and asking for a group here. Critical engagements give several times more experience and metal in comparison to skirmishes, and they are quite worth doing. There are some engagements that are more tricky than others, and some that spawn solo challengers or duels, but I'll be covering those later in the guide. Bosnia is also filled with regular enemies scattered all around the map. These enemies can be easily divided into two main groups, Imperial or Magitek units, and Wildlife or Monsters. Killing these roaming enemies does not give you metal or experience, but they drop different valuables and can spawn some engagements. Imperial enemies have the 4th Legion or Magitek wording in their names, and they're all some kind of Garlean units or machinery. 
these enemies can drop Bosun clusters, which are tradable items you can use as a currency at the Quartermaster in base. Magitek enemies are generally weak to magical damage. One thing to add about Magitek enemies is that they are the ones that generally lead to spawning critical engagements and skirmishes. Wildlife enemies usually have Bosjan or Zadnor wording in their names. Wildlife enemies are monsters, creatures, and so on, and they drop fragments you can use for special Bosjan duty actions. Fragments are essentially like logograms in Eureka, if that helps. Sprites are special in a sense that they only spawn during their respective weather windows. For example, water sprites during rain, and they drop a different fragment than other enemies around them. They also aggro by magic, so casting magic around them can be dangerous. Their damage is therefore reflectable with the use of Lost Reflect action, making them a relatively easy target to farm. Star enemies are especially difficult boss enemies that spawn in specific locations, and they drop certain types of fragments in larger quantities than other enemies. All of them can be killed with Lost Death action, though this is safer done in a group. Bajo also has Ashkin types of enemies, which are just monsters that spawn during night, and these are only special because they have sound aggro and are normally rank 5 or rank 3. So some can wreck you unless you sneak around by toggling a wall. They also drop fragments, but nothing unique to them that you can't get otherwise, though so it is sometimes a more convenient option. Speaking of rank, all the enemies inside Bosio have one assigned to them. Rank 1 and 2 enemies are essentially trash, very easy to kill solo. Rank 3 deserves a bit of respect. If you're solo, don't multiple this unless you're well stacked in your duty actions. Rank 4 hit quite hard, solo I don't recommend them at all unless you know what you're doing. Rank 5 are generally too hard for solo, so beware. Rank 4 and 5 within skirmishes usually just have too much HP and hit a bit harder. So to summarize, when you need metal or experience, you'll be focusing on skirmishes and critical engagements. When you need clusters or spawning skirmishes and critical engagements, you'll be focusing on 4th legion or magitic units. And when you need fragments, you'll generally be focusing on Bosjan or Zadnor wildlife units. Before we dive into fragments and lost actions, let's talk about metal. As I've mentioned, metal is basically the Bosjan experience you need to collect to progress the story. Every time you gather a sufficient amount of metal, you need to go to the commander and he'll give you a resistance rank up. These ranks cannot be lost or reduced in any way. They unlock new story points for you as well as new areas of the maps. However, after you reach rank 5, you start losing metal whenever you die. You lose a small portion of metal if you just die, and a larger portion if you also choose to return without getting raised by another player. The overall amount of metal you lose for release is akin to about one skirmish, so it's not that bad. You'll be getting new quests every rank or two, many of them unlocking valuable things for you and allowing you to progress at a faster pace, so don't sleep on resistance rank upgrades. Additionally, if you notice anyone doing a duo critical engagement while you're in Bosia or Zadnor, it may pay off to stare nearby that engagement. If the dueling person manages to win, everyone who is around the encounter gets an hour-long metal buff. Beware that this buff falls off early if you leave the instance, so try to make a full use of it if you ever get it. Maximum rank is 25, and once you get there, you'll be able to turn in your extra metal for honor buffs. Essentially, 20 million metal can be exchanged for 3 honor medals, and these medals you could choose to assign to your passive stats, HP, damage, or healing. When fully upgraded, Honor buffs will passively buff your HP by 50%, damage by 30%, and healing by 100% from the initial Bosjan stats. Whenever you're doing Bosjan related content, you'll have access to specialized duty actions called Lost Actions. This system unlocks at rank 2, and it's constantly upgraded throughout the story quests inside Bosjan and Zadnor. The Lost Actions window may look a little bit daunting at first, but no worries, here's a rundown. The system consists out of the cache and a holster. Anytime you have some fragments, you can appraise them with the appraiser NPC, which makes them go into the cache. You can see the cache as your overall storage for every action you currently own. If you want to use any of these actions, you first need to put them into your holster, which is essentially like a bag you carry around. Holster has a specific capacity, and it becomes larger and larger the more you progress the story. It can also be additionally upgraded by finding or buying three synthetic garlian fibers and trading them to this NPC in Gangos. Maximum capacity will be 99 after all of the possible upgrades. Even though the cash inventory may look messy, there are essentially three different types of lost actions. Beauty actions, usable items, and essences. 
Beauty actions are all these icons at the top of the window, organized into different categories of how they perform. They are essentially additional abilities or spells you can use while you are inside Bosia instances. They give you a lot of variety in gameplay and you can equip a maximum of two at any given time. My suggestion is to visit Actions and Traits, General, and then put Beauty Action 1 and 2 on your hotbars. This way you'll always have your Duty Actions keybinded somewhere for easy use. Note that these actions will not draw if you change the instance or decide to change a job. As a side note, if you want to move this little window anywhere else, you can do it from the HUD layout menu by selecting duty elements. Usable items are basically phoenix downs, potions, aethers and such. Within Bosia you get access to these special restoratives that can be useful to have around. They do not take up a duty action spot, instead they can be used directly from the holster or dragged to your hotbars. Essences are passive abilities. They behave like permanent stances on your job. These can buff your HP or damage by a lot, give you a permanent lifesteal buff or simply buff other existing attributes you have. Once you use an essence, it no longer needs to be interacted with and it doesn't take any extra space on your hotbar or even the holster. However, remember that the essence does drop when you leave the instance or change your active job. In short, you'll always want to be using an essence paired with some useful duty actions. As you progress, different actions will be available to you, so specific recommendations will change as you go through Bosia and will be showcased in their respective instance chapters. Nice thing the game allows you to do is to save holster loadouts and give them names to be quick and efficient if you're changing jobs or joining different engagements, such as duels. To save it, you'll use the icons next to manage sets at the bottom of the caches list. Applying a set will fill your holster with the specified items from the cache, as long as there are enough items ready. As mentioned before, within Bosia you're getting actual job experience and poetics, as long as you're a job 71 or above. You'll get some amount of experience by finishing skirmishes, and about 3-4 to four times more when finishing critical engagements. Once you're maximum rank, the optimal way to level is to stay in the northern zone of Zadnor, join a party and try to run to every skirmish you see. Experience you get in Bosia can only be affected by items you can carry directly on you, such as experience buff earrings. If you don't have any experience buffing items already, there is a Bosia specific earring you can get from the achievements by appraising at least a thousand fragments. This is something you'll likely get naturally, but it can be sped up by buying cheapest fragments on market board or by joining a cluster farm or specific sprites farms such as dust weather sprites in Bosian Southern Front. Cluster farms don't drop fragments by themselves, but clusters can be exchanged for 5 fragments at the Quartermaster NPC. Bosia Earring also has a haste buff on it, which influences skill and spill speed. As a summary, here is what to pay attention to while going through Bosia ranks. Don't skip resistance rank upgrades, do them as soon as it's possible to do them, to unlock new actions and areas more quickly. Focus magitech enemies when you want to farm clusters or spawn engagements, and focus wildlife enemies when you want to farm fragments. Always use lost actions and upgrade them as soon as you get access to better ones. Pay attention to duels and join the watch party if you see one happening, you will get a medal buff if it succeeds. Party up whenever possible with people that are actively doing content, regardless of their rank. Focus ranking up to 25 first and then go back to finish any remaining content you want to do within Bosia. And with that in mind, let's start ranking up. Before you go in, try visiting a market board, type fragment with partial search checkmarked and check out the prices of the first few fragment stacks. You'll soon need a singular fragment of skill for a quest, so if they are cheap enough, get yourself a small stack. They are useful to have at the start, so a small stack won't hurt. Additionally, feel free to buy a few of any other fragments you can afford, stopping at fragments of compassion. Everything else is only usable after rank 11, so there will likely be no use for them in Bosnian Southern Front. Again, don't go overboard. The the game will give you small stacks of each fragment to start with as you are unlocking them, but if you have kill to spare, buying some ahead of time will make the journey more convenient for you. The starting few ranks of Bosia will go rather quickly, by simply following the quest line and slowly unlocking everything that you're able to unlock. When you're able to leave the base, don't skip talking to the NPC with a blue quest at the doorway, which unlocks the field records, and then talk to another NPC there with a blue quest, Dmitar. Accept this quest, and by finishing it, you'll be able to get your first rank up, and unlock the quest that allows you to use lost actions, lost no longer. 
Finish this quest, then pick up Lost No Longer and immediately give him the fragment you bought on Market Board. If you did not buy any fragments, no worries. Simply go outside to the zone again and kill any rank 1 or 2 monster enemies. Only wildlife, not 4th legion. Once you finish Lost No Longer, you'll be able to use Lost Actions. At this point, you're somewhere between rank 2 and 3 and you can only use actions that come from fragments of caution, preparation and skill. These fragments all drop by doing things in the southernmost area of Bosia, the so-called Zone 1. Go to the cache and appraise any fragments that you can. This is the system that allows you to actually do the content in a pretty decent amount of time and pretty safely, so don't skip on this just because it may look a little bit complicated at the beginning. Time to equip some stuff. For your essence, you'll choose one depending on your job. As a tank, pick Martialist, as a healer, pick Aether Weaver, as a caster, pick Veteran, and as a physical DPS, pick Bearer for now. These are your only options, really, for now. Remember that once you put an essence to your holster, you need to click it to activate it. It will remain active for as long as you are in the instance unless you change a job. For your duty actions, you are still pretty limited, so equip whatever you want to try out. New actions will become available at rank 5, so don't worry too much if you don't have everything filled out. Once this is done, go out into the open and participate in skirmishes, aka fates, and critical engagements when you get a notice that it popped. If there is someone participating in a duel, go near it to potentially get a metal buff if it succeeds. Avoid fighting rank 4 and 5 enemies, as well as any star mob you may encounter. If nothing is popping on its own, you can kill some rank 1 and rank 2 4th legion enemies for a chance of clusters dropping, about 20-25% to for those ranks, and them spawning skirmishes. You should get to rank 5 pretty quickly, after which you should go pick up a new quest in order to unlock better lost actions. Before you get to rank 5, you don't lose any metal upon dying, so don't worry too much about taking any risks here. At rank 5, physical jobs get access to some better lost actions, coming from fragments of Ingenuity, Air and Awakening. This is also when you unlock the central zone of Bosia, the so-called Zone 2, and you should immediately attune to the Olina Stand Aetherite that becomes available. The mentioned fragments all drop inside Zone 2. Since you already have some that the game gave you, plus ones you potentially bought, see if you can change any of your lost actions now. As a DPS, you can now swap your plate bearers and veterans into a skirmisher if you have one. For your duty actions, they will depend on if you're a physical or magical DPS. For physical, I'd recommend using Lost Cure and Lost Spellforge. As a tank, keep Martialist as your essence and also tank Cure and Spellforge as your duty actions. Fourth Legion enemies are generally weak to magical damage and using Spellforge makes your physical damage do magical instead. You can keep this setup till rank 10. For magical DPS and the healer, you can keep Veteran and Eighth Weaver stances until you get to rank 8, when you get some upgrades. You're generally already doing magical damage, so don't worry about Spellforge, and Steel Sting isn't very useful in Bosia. Keep doing skirmishes until you reach rank 8. If you happen to need some fragments, kill wildlife enemies. Some skirmishes pop on their own, while others need Garlean units killed, and those are normally also leading to critical engagements, so it's very useful to kill 4th Legion units in downtime. Besides, they can drop some clusters, which is never a bad idea to have around. There are a few engagements in Zone 2 I'd like to warn you about. Firstly, at rank 7 quest location, there may be some rank 5 Ashkin enemies around the quest mark, if you are there during Eorzean nighttime. You have to toggle walk in order to avoid these, be very careful of running around there. If you go during daytime, this area is fully safe to walk through. Secondly, the tricky critical engagement that usually kills a whole bunch of people and even fails often is the one titled Red Juktober. And this one can be easily solved after rank 8 by equipping Reflect and using it every 7-8 to eight seconds during the meteor shower, making sure you do not lose the Reflect buff. Sadly, Reflect is only craftable at rank 8 and later, so I suggest potentially skipping this CE if it pops, or check a guide in the description. Rank 8 is where a new quest is available, which unlocks the northernmost area, the so-called Zone 3. Zone 3 also drops new fragments, support, violence and resolve. However, as a tank or physical DPS, you can keep the actions you had equipped before. As a magical DPS or a healer, this is a good chance to swap your essence to ordained and equip lost death as your duty action. Death won't work on bosses or Ashkin enemies, but you can generally use it to speed up farming or even try to kill star mobs with it. For your holster, keep some backup healing actions and lost reflect, in case you need it for the Chuktober's critical engagement or sprite fragment farming. 
Unless you need zones 1 and 2 for your relic memory farm or some fragment farms, it's better to stick to zone 3 for skirmishes from now on, due to better metal gain. However, if a critical engagement pops anywhere in the southern front, it is worth applying to it. It should not take you too long to get to rank 10. To mention some notable engagements, Skirmish Cold of Steel and Flame can be a bit dangerous to do solo. It consists out of two consecutive bosses which are rather tanky. For the Magitic Colossus, beware of his sword, standing in front will cause you to take extra damage. A notable critical engagement is Metal Fox Chaos, which spawns after the previously mentioned Skirmish. The boss, Dainsliff, does a variety of moves that hit Magitek bits on the side, which then reflect this damage in circles around the boss, or in various other patterns. Be ready to look around the edges of this arena a lot, and I recommend having some Phoenix Downs and Cure 3s for this engagement. The second notable critical engagement is Trampled Under Hood, with a dog boss who does a variety of gaze attacks. The key mechanic to remember is Demon Gaze, which is gonna petrify you and basically be fatal unless you are blinded before it hits you. How do you get blinded? By looking at the outside gaze mechanics. Additionally, during the night, the northernmost etherite has some rank 5 Ashkin horses sitting around, which can be quite deadly unless you toggle walk and sneak past them. Once you are rank 10 and finish your available quests, you will unlock the final critical engagement of Bosia, Castrum Lacusitore. Now, you can join it as soon as it's available, but if you're unlucky and have to wait, feel free to stay in Bosnian Southern Front longer. You'll unlock new lost actions at ranks 11 and 12, but those fragments only drop from Castrum, so your setup will be based around your rank 8 actions. You can use the downtime to perhaps farm some of the fragments you're missing, so before we fully dive into Castrum, it's worth noting some valuable fragment farming options for you to know while you are in Bosnian Southern Front. Whenever there is a weather window up that's not fair skies, there are some sprites available in some of the Bosnian Southern Front zones. The sprites in Southern Front drop fragments of preparation, care, and support. And higher rank sprites drop more fragments per kill. The full sprite map is here, also available in the main sheet. For any sprite farming, ideally you want to remove your equipment to reduce your defense and use Lost Reflect action to fully reflect the sprite damage back. If you are a tank, you can use Essence of the Irregular to make the reflected damage even higher. Just be aware to use your first reflect far enough from sprites, as the first cast around them will aggro a bunch. Here's an overview of other fragments obtainable in Bosnian Southern Front. All of them are good to have, but Resolve and Violence usually go for highest amount on Gale on Market Board and are tedious to get. For Star Mobs, it's a good idea to party up with people. Usually people farm them with Ordained and Lost Death combos. If in party, you can sleep most of the Star Mobs so they don't awaken while you're using your death. The only one that can be slept is Angel, the wonky fish. Even if you are spread apart for different star mobs, fragments will go to everyone in the party, so this is not recommended solo. Their respawn timer is 30 minutes. With you as a rank 10 or more, you are now ready to take on the Castrum when it pops. Castrum Lacuslitore, or CLL for short, is a special critical engagement available after you reach rank 10 story progression point. This is built more like an alliance rate than a regular critical engagement. It pops at varied times, its cooldown can be anywhere between 30 and 60 minutes, depending on the activity of the instance. The more skirmishes and engagements are being done, the more quickly it pops. It can host up to 48 people, but it can be comfortably done with even tiny groups, like 5 to 6 people. Difficulty-wise, this is not any harder than an alliance raid. However, it can get quite messy if duty is full and most people don't have actions. Generally speaking, smaller groups have stronger echo and communicate better, so don't be afraid to join even if there's only a group of few people joining who know what they're doing. Once Castrum pops, you can apply to it as any other critical engagement, except that the window to apply is rather long. There will be a cache at the entrance, so you can do some last minute lost actions preparations inside, but my recommendation is to use the 6 minutes of waiting time in Southern Front to prepare in peace. Here is what you'll want to have depending on your role, and note this is for first timers. For your essence, generally take something DPS heavy. For your lost actions, physical jobs will take Spellforge, which is gonna help against all mechanical enemies inside, and I'd highly recommend bringing Cure 3, or just any cure action you have. You may or may not have a healer in party, so take care of yourself. If you do have healers, leave Cure 3 in your holster and bring Lost Slash or Banners of Honor Sacrifice or Noble Ends instead. 
Magical jobs can take a protective action alongside their lost death. Alongside your actions and regardless of your job, it's a good idea to bring resistance potions and phoenixes. At the beginning, the parties will split into two sections, which should be about similar in length and difficulty. Half of the people will stay down next to the big machine, while other half will go towards the left side and climb the stairs up. Now, if you have a very small raid, sometimes the more experienced, smaller group will go alone upstairs, while the rest of the people stay downstairs. However you split up, the communication here is the key. Don't pull any of the bosses until parties confirm through yell chat that everyone is in position. These two bosses will ideally die within 3 minutes of each other. If this doesn't happen, the Colossus spawns with an enraged cast. However, if people have brought lost deaths, you can kill him with a bit of luck. During these boss fights, parties will often communicate a percentage of the boss HP in yell chat to make sure no group is falling behind too much. Either way, it's not a bad idea to keep the HP of the bosses within 20% of each other at worst, but don't panic if they don't die at exactly the same time. The bottom group has a job of protecting the big machine that's smashing the cast room doors, which is why you want more people on bottom, in case of a smaller party. Whenever you see arrows pointing in these blue line AoEs, you should step in and soak some damage that would otherwise go to the machine. There are some tethers that are best swapped between people, as every consecutive tether shot gives you more damage due to the vulnerability it applies. The top group is dealing with Brionak. Brionak doesn't require any damage to be soaked, but he occasionally attacks the big machine below as well, when he uncovers his Magitech core. The quicker the core dies, the less damage tunnel armor below gets, so it's crucial to focus the core. This is why even a small amount of people up here with strong lost actions can get this done successfully. In terms of other mechanics, when Brionak's pointy hand is glowing, go stand next to it. Light orbs are donut attacks, while dark orbs are big point blank AoE, so you'll have to pay attention to their layout and safe spots. After the bosses are done, parties will merge and you'll find your first personal loot chest. This and all the other chests inside have to be opened manually by every single person. It is your personal loot. Don't forget to take it. Next section will have parties split up again. After clearing up some trash bags, you'll see that the map has six similar looking hallways. This is where you'll generally see people start typing locations in chat such as north, northwest, southwest, etc. The six hallways each have three rooms at the end. One room that's empty, one that holds some mobs and the key to progress further, and one that has a prisoner who's being tortured. The more prisoners the raid saves, the more treasure chests with cast room unique fragments they get later. So, as we all love our loot, this is where parties prioritize splitting up, quickly locating the prisoners and freeing them up first. This is where your lost death actions will come handy on magical jobs to help speeding up the kills needed to free up the prisoners. Once prisoners are freed up, the other room with the enemies can be cleared. There's a button inside that simply needs to be touched and once all six buttons are touched, the raid can progress. The next boss is pretty straightforward and it is the only boss affected by steel sting in here, so if you brought it, apply it to any magical jobs. When you see four orbs in the arena, take a note of which two the boss is tethering to, those are the mechanics it will do first. One of the elements that might be a bit hard to spot is fire. After it goes off, you get pyretic debuff that does big damage to you if you move around or act. Other than that, follow the group and you should be fine for this boss. For full list of mechanics and macros, check the description. Lastly, there is Davon or Davon or the Griffin. For this boss, you may notice some people are talking about who takes top or who will stay down or who will take lion. At some point during the fight, you'll see a teleport to the small platform on the side where 8 players can jump to, or random players will be taken to, in order to do a mini boss. If raid party is very small, usually one tank arranges to stay down with the griffin boss and everyone else goes up, so that the game doesn't accidentally take wrong people up. It is not a difficult fight, to generally keep yourself behind Leon if you get up. For the main boss, Daven the Griffin expect a lot of the movement. Whenever he does orb mechanics, the light one is safe to stay under. Note that if there is any wind in the arena, the light orb will move two slots in the direction of the wind. So position yourself there. Other than that, his main mechanic is a memory game, with crosses and donut AoEs. Take note of these markers and their order as Daven is casting them and staying in circles while moving diagonally away from the crosses. With these mechanics in mind and well-prepared lost actions, you should be okay, but if you're anxious about it, check description for a full list of mechanics. 
After you're done with Castrum, you should jump so much in metal that you'll get to rank 12 unless you died many, many times. If you somehow aren't rank 12 at the end of this, I suggest getting to it before continuing onwards to the Lubrum. You may stay in Bosia longer and do some more Castrum if you wish to get yourself rank 15 and build your relic further, but my suggestion is to get to 12 and try to get to Zadnor as quickly as possible as you'll progress there a lot faster. Finishing your quests after Castrum will get you through some sweet cutscenes, solo instance and finally unlocking the Lubrum Regine. When you unlock it, you'll find yourself in this little waiting area. Feel free to leave it and prepare for the dungeon. The Lubrum is an instance you join through Duty Finder, not from inside Bosia, and it can host up to 24 players. The duty is designed for level 80 and cannot be done for leveling purposes, so you'll need to do it on a job level 80 or higher. Here is where it becomes weird. Since the Lubrum is outdated, very specific content that doesn't pop too often, and because it can be done with variable amount of people, Square Enix devs have decided to help your queue times. They did this by enforcing the Lubrum to pop after exactly 10 minutes, unless you have a full alliance of 24 players, in which case it pops immediately. Now this sounds like good news, but in reality this means that queuing into the Lubrum will always cause a 10 minute waiting timer. after. Which which you'll get a pop, and more than likely you'll be there all alone. To make matters worse, you cannot do this alone. You simply cannot, not at rank 12 with the actions you have available. Not even as a duo is this really viable, you'll need at least 4-5 to five people to make it comfy, but ideally a full party to get through this at a normal pace. The good news though is that there are often people wanting to run this content for various relic materials or story progression reasons or simply because they like the content. However, to find these people you do not want to queue randomly. Instead, you must use the party finder. Use party finder. This is not advice, it's necessity. Unless you have 6-7 to seven of your own friends who want to do the dungeon with you. To open party finder, select field operations, the loop room, and make sure to write you need it for the story progression or something akin to that. After you get your party filled up, it is a good idea to do a ready check for queue time just to make sure that everyone is on a battle job of an appropriate level, 80 or higher. When you queue, you'll wait the 10 minutes. It is a good idea to send a message or a sound notice in chat about a minute before the pop to make sure people are around when the duty finally pops. This is admittedly the most annoying part of the process and if Square ever changes the system, I'll make sure this part of the video is cut out. Once you enter the duty, there's a cache inside for some last minute preparations. Usually people are already prepped because they have 10 minutes to communicate things ahead of time and there is a holster in Gangos for you to use while waiting. So use this cache only to replenish holster with some backups after you've popped your essence and actions. What lost actions to bring though? I will assume you are rank 12 and you've gotten some fragments from Castrum. You'll be able to prep loadouts focused around this. Generally speaking, you want to use deep essences when possible. These are just better versions of the regular essences. As a tank, use Martialist. As a DPS, use Skirmisher. And as a healer, use Aether Weaver. For your lost actions as a tank or any physical DPS job, it is useful to have some lost points of power. These are great to use during your burst windows on bosses and they come from fragments of sagacity that drop from Castrum. As a tank, if there aren't any healers in the party, you should pack some resistance medkits unless you want to die a lot during the last boss. As a healer or a caster, you can use lost fonts of magic instead, especially if you can pair them with some aether kits to help mana replenishment. As a healer, you can also bring Banish 3, which is specifically used for a boss called the Bosian Phantom, as it is undead. Generally speaking, there are some traps inside the duty between the bosses, so one perception is useful to have. Anyone can have some spares in the holster, but usually more experienced players bring this. As mentioned, if you stayed in Bosia longer and got yourself to rank 15, check description for alternative loadout recommendations, as you can get some better actions at that point. These bosses are proper sponges designed around people using lost actions, so not bringing any kind of decent setup will result in quite a draining experience. Most of the bosses here do give you a bit of a learning curve, they show simplified mechanics first before starting to build them up. Instead of one shots, you'll be getting a twice come ruin stack when you fail a dodgeable mechanic. Getting a second stack of this will result in an uncleansable doom. Normal raising abilities do work in this version of the Lubrum, so dying is not too bad, though you do lose some metal. 
For the first boss, Trinity Seeker, you'll utilize the barriers to get either knocked into them or defend against large AoEs by standing behind them. When he does four Shining Katanas move, note that it is better to stay close to the boss to quickly avoid them. His Katanas do a 45 degree angle arena split, so if his back Katanas are shining, standing directly front is safe. If his left katanas are shining, standing to its directly right is safe. So direct opposite is safe. Seasons of Mercy can be a tricky attack. You need to move away from the flower that doubles in size, look away from the orb that applies Petrify, and also move to dodge the floor pattern. My suggestion is to locate the orb first, turn away from it, and then run to resolve the mechanic while looking away. Disengage the boss if needed. There will be some traps between Seeker Arena and Dahu, the first trash boss, so don't run in front of people. Either wait for trap reveals or for a tank to face tank them. Dahu has no special mechanics, but beware of a lot of dashes and boss tail and hand swipes. For Feral Howl, you'll get pushed back, so don't get pushed into the AoEs. The second real boss here is the Queen's Guard, pawns that will first be together, but then you'll fight them one by one, each having a unique mechanics. These mechanics may repeat later during the last boss, so it's worth paying attention to them. Bomb Slinger is a mechanic that can be a bit confusing to understand at first. Normally, you'll stand on the big balls and then move out as you fall. However, if the boss casts a reversal of forces, indicated by a tether to small bombs or yourself, stand on the small balls instead. When all four pawns are defeated individually, they will reappear and start casting enraged shenanigans. After some time, they cast Coat of Arms, which puts some reflective shields on themselves, so beware not to hit them in the direction of the shield. The third boss, or the second trash, is Bosjian Phantom. Really simple, undead enemy, weak to banish. Nothing notable here, prepare for a lot of movement indicated by arrows. There will be four total traps in between him and the next boss, so beware of running around. Trinity Avowed, or Katy Perry, has one notable mechanic, hot and cold. This hits you with a debuff that every individual person has to resolve for themselves. You can get one or two hot or cold markers. Hot and cold has three variations through which you can resolve them. No matter the variation, you need to be hit by the opposite element in such a way that your temperature balances out to zero. First, she'll cast these meteors, which have a hot and cold debuff themselves. Locate the one you need and stand in its AoE. Alternatively, she'll do these sword wipes, so stay close to her until you see the element you need and then stand on the sword side. Lastly, she'll do this big flame pull that leaves only one row of tiles safe on the arena. Specific tiles will be hit by either hot or cold element, so locate the one you need to stand on by looking at the arrows on the opposite side. The game will show you once which path they will take, but the easy way to know it to yourself is to note that the arrows will take every turn they run into. Finally, welcome to the Queen's Arena. She'll do a variety of mechanics you've already seen, mostly from the Queen's Guard fight. Her main mechanic is Queen's Edict, or Chess as we like to call it. She'll put a number on your head and you'll have to move that many arena tiles in order to resolve the mechanic. Note that only direct movement from your initial tile counts. If you go diagonally, it'll count as two tiles. Just move in straight lines away from your initial tile until your number disappears. Wait for the mechanic to give you check mark and then move freely. If she puts the numbers on the pawns, they will move specified amount of spots and then they will do a cross AoE from this new position. She'll be spawning Queen's Guard as the fight progresses, then repeating the mechanics they did before and when things start overlapping, always prioritize her mechanic over the pawns. One thing to add is, tanks will be getting doom from the tank buster a few times during the fight. Healers can and should as soon as this, but in the absence of healers, tanks should use resistance medkits for this cleanse. Again, if you need more detailed list of mechanics, check the description. Beating the Lubrum will give you a lot of metal, about 2 ranks worth when you're rank 12, bringing you immediately to 14 when you start Zadnor. The Lubrum can be farmed later for a relic step or some coins you unlock at the very end, so now it's time to go to Zadnor. Welcome to Zadnor, a slightly better but longer version of Bosja. Zadnor is structured very similarly to the first instance, being split into three zones that are all quest locked, and ending with a large alliance raid style engagement. However, Zadnor is slightly more pretty than Bosja, which I'd argue is very important for the overall enjoyment of the content. 
Also, after rank 11 and all up to rank 18, you get access to some really fun lost actions, so the experience of farming skirmishes and engagements should be more fun here. The issue that you'll often run into while in Zadnor is that the first two zones are poorly populated, while zone 3 is bursting with activity. So your progress may slow down a bit here, but at least it should be fun to play around with all kinds of actions you get. Finally, your recommended essences significantly change here for Zadnor, which for the most part unlock between ranks 12 and 18. This is where many, many different variations of lost actions open up for you to use. The recommendations I'll give are going to be focused around safest and easiest options, but if you want to play around with the system, I highly recommend doing so. As usual, the main sheet is filled with information if you want to dig a bit deeper into the system. As previously mentioned, all of the recommendations will be based around actions unlocked between ranks 12 and 18 and they are useful until the end of Zatmor. For tanks, you'll want to use the Essence of the Bloodsucker from now on. As most DPS jobs, you'll usually want to use the Essence of the Beast. Both of these essences come with a passive lifesteal effect, so the more damage you do to enemies, the more you heal back from it. This will allow you to do some bigger and safer pulls, and this is pretty much your main instance essence from now on. As a Black Mage specifically, you can consider swapping Beast to Watcher at rank 18 if you have some chain spells to spend. This way, you'll get infinite instant instant casts, but make sure to pack some healing as well, just to help yourself survive. Whether this is better or worse than Beast is a matter of preference, but I'd say it's fun. As a healer, you'll want to use the Essence of the Templar. All of these essences come from Castrum Lacus Litora, chests after rescuing the prisoners, so if you need to farm some, that's what to do. Going back to do Castrum occasionally isn't a bad idea at this point, as it gives good fragments and about half a rank worth of metal at this stage. Alternatively, get a few fragments from Market Board. Once again, this is a point where Lost Action System becomes really varied and fun and I'd recommend playing around with it. When it comes to Zadnor progression, quests that open new areas come at rank 18 and 22, so don't forget to attune as soon as you get the new teleports. Zone 1 should go relatively quickly, depending on your rank. At rank 16, you'll be able to use an item called Lodestone, which comes from fragments of history, farmable in Zone 1. Lodestone allows you to instantly teleport to the base of Zadnor, which is of great help due to the sheer amount of quests that Zadnor has you do. I do recommend finishing quests as they come, as they do give you a good amount of metal and allow you for some lost action as upgrades. Zone 1 can be a bit poorly populated, but thankfully it does not need too many engagements to progress through. If things are not popping, target magitic units to push the skirmishes and critical engagements to pop. With your life stealing essences now, this should be more comfortable than ever. Notable engagements in Zone 1 include a skirmish called Breaking the Ice, which instantly kills you if you get frozen from Ice Sprite AoEs. This one is usually best avoided, it's quite tanky and not a lot of people do it, but it's really easy to die. Critical Engagement, a familiar face, features Hashmal, boss from Rabanastra, that has very similar mechanics to the Alliance Raid boss. Beware of the pillars dropping, as well as Hashmal's copy on the side of the arena, occasionally cleaving one half of the arena. Zone 2 is potentially a zone that will take you the most amount of time to get done. It is not overly popular with players, some skirmishes are rather annoying, and it's also a bit annoying to move around, with various bridges connecting smaller areas. Lost Actions recommendations are generally staying the same. For notable engagements, the challenge accepted skirmish is quite iffy, usually too tanky and even dangerous on damage values to do solo. There is a big bad critical engagement, Time to Burn, which features Belias, a boss from Ridorana. This boss usually results in a massive carnage, so it's worth preparing a bit for it. Belias will do the floor clock mechanic from Ridorana, where two of the clock spots go slower than others, but this time he'll put a pause to all of the clocks and resolve them at a later time, so you'll need to remember which clock spots were safe. You can however take Reflect or Lost Curtains with you to help with clock mechanic in case you forget where a safe spot is because they do magical damage. Second big mechanic he does is the smaller clocks which will move around until they stop and do conal AoEs. There is a simple trick to locate a safe spot spot for these conals, which is a bit hard to explain, so check the images. If there are only two clocks rotating, you can go to any place north or south from their horizontal position. If there are three clocks rotating, check which two are facing each other first. When you find those, you'll know the safe spot is either north or south of them. 
Then see where the third clock handle is facing and go to that side. Lastly, Belias will also spawn his copies to dash through the arena from three directions, leaving only one floor clock tile safe from them. If this is all confusing, make sure to check a better guide made by my buddy June from the description. At rank 22, you will unlock the last area, Zor 3, and the two remaining etherites are both available to attune to, Yeban and Harmovir Point. I suggest immediately attuning to both of them, as you'll spend a lot of your time in Zone 3, and these are both quite useful. Zone 3 is where usually most people hang out, therefore skirmishes here are done incredibly quickly, and it's worth finding a party to join, for easier time getting gold ratings from these engagements. If you have a hard time finding a group, consider taking a tank job or or a lost in sense action to help you with getting gold ratings as they are mostly tied to aggro generation. Also, if you have some clusters to spare and you haven't already, you can buy the map that allows you to move more quickly through the areas of Bajia. Because of the overall activity of Zone 3, it should be pretty painless experience to be here. However, the amounts of metal you need from ranks 22 to 25 are pretty high, so it might still take you a few hours to finish this part. For notable engagements, there are a few. There is yet another red chocobo involving skirmish, which has chocobos spawning meteor showers to nobody's surprise. From critical engagements, one that usually causes carnage is Aida Snake. The reason for that is mostly the very late telegraphed AoEs and the fact that many things happen all at once so it's difficult paying attention. The boss does Carib this move a few times which brings your HP down to one digit and it's worth having a resistance potion kit active so that you immediately heal back up when this happens. Beware of backlash and forelash moves that target half of the arena either behind or front of the boss. Twisting Winds is a line AoE and this catches people off guard because other mechanics are happening with it and you need to pay attention to not stand directly in front or behind the boss. Once you rank 25 you'll be able to finish your quest line for now and and unlock Dalriada, the last Alliance Raid style critical engagement you need to do. Dalriada Q works similarly to Castrum Lacusitore. It pops from inside the instance and you have 6 minutes to apply to it. Like Castrum, it can host up to 48 players and it's scaling down significantly with smaller groups, providing extra echo when a group is under 8 people. For lost actions, recommendations are similar to general Zadnor tips. Use Bloodsucker or Beast Essences for physical job along with the Font of Power. Use Ordain on magical jobs with the exception of Black Mage and pair it with Lost Font of Magic. Black Mage can take Watcher paired with Chainspell or Skirmisher paired with Font of Magic. Healers usually pair their Ordained Essence with Spellforge and it can be used on first and third boss of Dalriada. Lost Steel Sting is useful on second boss of Dalriada, so if you have extra room you can grab that too as a healer. Alternatively, Lost Font of Magic and Chainspell are also useful on healers. Like I mentioned in Zadnor Tips, many more foreign options are available to you now. You can check the main sheet if you want to play around with something else. At the beginning of Dalriada, there's another raid split up waiting for the group. There are 8 flying scooters available on the left side of the entrance, allowing for one party to mount up and travel to another parallel boss to the first one. As a newcomer, I recommend going to the standard boss, staying down. On smaller parties, usually only 3-5 to five people go to the second boss, which is a familiar face from previous Bosnian engagements. The bottom boss is consisted out of several known bosses from the previous instance, nothing new here. The second boss is a big poisonous guy and he's the one you can apply steel sting for if you brought one. When the boss is casting fleshy necromass, step into the green puddles to become a nice little pudding. Rest of the mechanics are quite straightforward. After this boss, parties will split up into two parallel hallways, left and right. Some people need to stand back to look at the monitors and relay information about how parties in the hallways can safely move. This group of minimum four people also needs to find some monsters and actually stand on the ground glass floor. Not standing on the floor will cause electricity to shoot other players in the hallways. The monitors will be showing which sides of the hallways will be hit and usually one person in shout chat is doing the callouts for the safe spot, such as LL, indicating that both safe spots are on the left side. Beware of the telegraphed line AoEs that occasionally happen in the hallways as you're passing. Once both parties touch the button at the same time, raid can continue. The third boss will start with a Magitek dude to basically teach you his mechanics, but halfway he'll be joined by our good old friend Dawan, Davon the Griffin. <laughs> Davon the Younger doesn't have any new mechanics and you'll simply have to dodge the spinning dude shenanigans while avoiding Dawan's stuff as well. The spinning shenanigans are telegraphed with a thin line on the arena before he actually starts spinning, so paying attention to his brief telegraph can help you plan your movement. 
The Magitech dude can be affected by spell forge, so it's a good idea to apply this to physical jobs in order to make this fight a bit faster. Finally, last boss is Diablo Armament. Turning your BGM to 100 is mandatory here. The boss has straightforward movement mechanics, but it can get messy really quickly. Magitech bits will be appearing occasionally, shooting lasers in the direction they are facing. The most difficult mechanic sequence to deal with is definitely the Diabolic Gate. The boss will leave his usual spot and spawn somewhere else, preparing for a line dash. He'll be dashing into a doorway that has a specific colored and shaped icon on them. He'll then continue dashing from those doors, going into the next one and the next one. To clarify, if he goes into the green butterfly doors, next line AoE will start from the other green butterfly doorway. Check where that line would be facing and locate the other icon of the same kind. Third one will start from there. You can look at the star shape on the floor as an indicator to how wide these line AoEs are. Usually the movement is not too complex and you can follow the group and even survive a hit. There will be four jumps all together, followed by a close proximity donut AoE, so go towards the boss. Towards the end of the fight, Diablo Armament will do a nice little disco show as a celebration to you clearing this content. It is also followed by million AoEs and acceleration bombs that you need to stand still for in order to resolve them correctly. After you're done with Dalriada, finish up your questline. This will unlock several new things for you. First is a vendor, resistance supplier, that sells Final Fantasy XII glamour items for Bosnian platinum coins that drop in Dalriada. Second, you can now talk to Counselor NPC to unlock resistance honors that allow you to turn your metal into permanent HP, damage, and healing buffs. This will be a really good use for a metal if you stick around longer in Bosnian instances. There is also weekly quests available in Gangos that gives you a bonus platinum coins for finishing Dalriada and Castrum called a ruined opportunity. Now, this is a good chance to either go back to spots you need to finish relic quests for, this time with stronger actions and some passive honor buffs, or go do stuff you didn't focus on yet at all. For example, duels or nodes farming, or the Lubrum Regine Savage, and this is something I'll talk a bit about in the final chapter. Bosio's primary purpose is to be building Shadowbringer's relics, and the questing system here is quite similar to how Realm Reborn and Heavensward go about their relics, meaning you'll have to collect various items by doing either Bosia or other types of content, but in order for these items to drop at all, you'll have to have their quest active. The most current steps show up at the top of the list. You also have to have the previously finished relic versions equipped when you're taking new steps, but when you're submitting a relic to finish a step, it needs to be in your inventory. Starting with For Want a Memory, which you can unlock right as you unlock Bosnian Southern Front, you have 10 different stages of building your relic, and anytime you get access to the new step, I advise you to take it. You can take the quest with any job level 80 or higher that came out in Shadowbringers, and Walker and Dawn Trail jobs don't have Bosnian relics. Many of the steps are actually required only once. If you do consecutive relic weapons later, you'll skip 4 steps, leaving you with 6 repeatable ones. Anytime you pick up a new quest, you can take a previous step with another job and eventually you can have all item dropping quests active at the same time, allowing you to passively work on multiple relics at once. There are only 5 repeatable quests that you need for all of the weapons, which you can activate and keep active for as long as you need them, and these are shown on the screen. Note that you'll start your first quest naturally by speaking to Zlatan and unlocking Bosja, but for consecutive weapons he'll ask you to obtain Thavnarian scale powders for the base weapon. These can be bought for 1000 poetics, from Oriana in Mordona or at any sundry splendors NPC near Aetherites in main cities. So while this quest is repeatable, I'm not counting it into the grindable quest above as you simply need to spend poetics whenever you accumulate them. Additionally, most of the steps can also be passively done by performing other content outside of Bosja. For a full list of all these steps and ways to grind them, check description. Once you've done the Lubrum Regine Normal, reached rank 15 in Bosnian Southern Front and amassed 700,000 metal, you'll be able to unlock the Lubrum Regine Savage by finishing a quest, a seaside story in Gangos. Unlike the normal version that hosts up to 24 players, DRS can host up to 48 players and it's actually very unusual to go in lower numbers. For those who have done Baldesian Arsenal before, the way DRS is structured and the restrictions inside will be familiar. However, DRS is mechanically more difficult and there is far more need for individual preparation in comparison with BA. Now, regardless of if this type of content is familiar to you or not, here is what to expect. Traditional raising abilities are not available while 
in DRS. The only way to raise someone is through special law sections that require some RNG or a sacrifice of another player. This content can only be done through Party Finder in pre-made parties. For this reason, but also to prepare properly, it is essential that you join a Discord that specializes in DRS on your data center. There's a full list of them in the description, so locate one that's accessible to you. Every Discord will require you to prepare a specific action set for your holster, depending on your job. All of them will require you to use pure essences and to have re-razors available. The fights are mechanically similar to the Lubrum Normal, but more complex, more quick, and with some additions, for example the solo duel that only one player can do and the initial split of parties before getting to the first boss. Definitely check up the guides beforehand, normally those that your relevant Discord server recommends. Most importantly, have fun and good luck getting your doggo. Field notes drop from various critical engagements, skirmishes, duels and quests. Using them will create a chapter in the field record, which is accessible in duty menu under collections tab. Duplicate field notes can be exchanged for lockboxes with the resistance historian. By collecting all 50 notes, you'll be getting achievements for each respective zone. Once you get all three achievements, you can redeem the Al Iqlil mount, which is basically a flying scooter inspired by the queen's chair design. Now, some of the field notes are easily accessible and mostly farmed passively as you rank through the content. However, some of them have a very low drop rate in quote-unquote normal content and mostly rely on duels to get obtained, which have 100% drop rate chance. Once you're ready to farm these, check a link in the description to find out what you're missing and how to obtain it. As mentioned, some of the field notes are acquired through duels, plus you may simply want to try and enjoy this challenging content while rewarding yourself and other people with a metal buff. By defeating any duel, you are rewarded quite handsomely. You get a field note, 100% metal buff that lasts an hour, a specific title to each duel, and 99 lockboxes. They also give 5 times more metal than other CEs of their area, with the exception of Leon and Satawa that give 10 times more. Very useful for your honors, building purposes, and the end. If you want to successfully finish the duels, this section will give you an overview of what you can expect. First things first, in order for any specific duel to pop, a specified chain of skirmishes and critical engagements needs to be cleared. There is only one duel per every zone of both instances, altogether six duels and six possible engagement chains that are showcased on the screen. In order to qualify for the duel and even get invited to participate, you need to finish the last critical engagement in the chain with no mistakes. This means no vulnerability stacks, aka no avoidable mechanics done wrong. If you were successful at this, you'll get a big bright pop-up where you can accept the invitation to the duel. If there are multiple people applying, one person will be chosen at random, while other applicants will gain one stack of notoriety, giving them priority in future duel applications. You cannot get notoriety if you decline the duel. There are two main ways of resolving these duels the so-called cheese method and the regular fighting the mechanics method. Which one you pick is up to you. The cheese method basically relies on you stacking up lost action so much that you break all damage records and essentially finish the duel before needing to worry about almost any mechanics. Since this guide is already long enough, I have linked a bunch of materials for both of these methods down in the description. Congratulations, you've reached the end of the guide and hopefully cleaned up all of the Bosnia content to your liking. Let me know in the comments how did you enjoy your journey, if the guide helped you and if there are any more questions left unanswered for you. I'm sure they were. This content is enormous. Once again, thank you Vega for helping me with the materials for this guide and to Square Enix for giving me Cloud Data Center for free for a whole week just so I can make a better guide. See you in the next field instance in Dawn Trail.